Let's see. Evan is one of our favorite guests here. His book, The Wines of South America, is for sale just outside this hall by Omnivore Books. I'd encourage you to pick up at least one copy. Evan will be signing them after the talk. Uh, and Evan is a master sommelier and one of the nation's most prolific food and wine industry veterans. His career started at the age of 19, which I'm pretty sure is before you're actually allowed to drink <laughs> in this country. Um, in the kitchens of restaurants in Paris and Napa and at Chez Panisse in Berkeley. In 1984, he joined his mother, chef and author Joyce Goldstein, who happens to be sitting in the front row tonight. Um, <laughs> in opening the wonderful Square One. And as sommelier, his wine lists received myriad of awards. In 1987, he became the eighth American and youngest ever at the time to pass the prestigious Master Sommelier examination. He's written several books, including his latest one, The Wines of South America, which he's here to talk about this evening. I'll let him tell you more about the book as you taste your way through it a bit tonight. But I just want to tell you that it really is an incredibly comprehensive guide to the wines of the continent. The information is organized in a really straightforward and easy to use fashion. You don't have to be a wine expert to understand it, but if you do have a lot of knowledge, there's plenty more for you there as well. So it's a must add to your library. So here's Evan Goldstein. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate it. I always feel weird with these like contraptions on your head that make you feel like you should be belting out a Janet Jackson tune or something, but I'll, I'll leave it there. And I promise no wardrobe malfunctions of any sort. Um, it's a treat to be here with all of you tonight. It's always a treat to do wine events here in town. As, uh, as my wife, who's also sitting in the front row, can attest to, I spend, uh, you know, people say, where do you live? I go, well, a good chunk of the time in San Francisco and the rest of the time in the Red Carpet Club, where they know you on a first-name basis, which is, by the way, not a good thing if you're spending too much time there. So it's a treat to be here, and it's a treat to be here um, speaking to my new book and, and to the wines of South America. Just for my own edification, it's great to find out how many people, it's great to see a huge number of people coming out for the first time for events here at the, uh, at the JCC, and I would encourage you to um, follow up. They've got a lot of terrific uh, speakers, not all wine, but other good food series folks and a number of other just tremendously talented folks who come in on a regular basis. I encourage you to do that. But how many of you have actually been to South America before? Okay, wow. That's pretty serious. Well, then you guys can, why don't you tell me about, never mind. <laughs> um, that's a treat. Usually you come to these things and maybe like one hand comes up or somebody else kind of like halfway puts their hand up and I go, well, what does that mean? Well, we were in transit. You know, we stopped by on our way over there, but we were actually heading to a different continent. But um, uh, for those of you who, who, who have been there, I'll tell you things that you probably already know. For those of you who don't, uh, haven't been there before, or were thinking about going there, one, I'd really encourage you to take some time to go down there. Uh, from a wine perspective, which is the lion's share of what we'll talk about tonight, there's a lot going on and a lot that merits your attention. But just as an avid explorer, uh, as a person who loves uh, seeing new and different things, South America is an amazing um, continent of 12 different countries, of which 10 produce wine. But um, if you're not a wine person, but you simply love to travel and see things that are really cool and the uh of whatever, you would find that if you're a big waterfall person, the world's highest waterfall is Angel Falls, which sits in Venezuela. Anybody been to Angel Falls in Venezuela? Ah, I think I'm going to get a hand up for every single one of these, but what the hell. Uh, you've got the driest spot on earth in the Atacama Desert. Does anyone know the Atacama Desert before? A spectacular place, and few, I figured a few people would, and uh, uh, brilliant for stargazing, by the way, if you're into that, that's a great place to go. Um, needless to say, this probably isn't a surprise to you, but the longest river in the world and the most water by volume of course is the Amazon which is uh, spectacular and worth visiting itself you have the second highest after the Andes but the longest uh, or after the Himalayas I should say but the longest mountain range in the world in the Andes and you have uh, the largest commercially navigable lake does that make sense to you the largest commercially in Lake Titicaca in Bolivia which also is home to as I found out the largest salt lake in the world in Salar de Uyuni which is great. And the southernmost city in the world is Ushuaia, which sits in Argentina. So this is a pretty massive place with a lot of amazing natural resources. And I didn't mention, you know, all the really cool 
beautiful cities and Iguazu Falls and all that other stuff. So um, that's worth going to. But we're not here to talk about tourism tonight. Apparently Rick Steves couldn't be here tonight. He was in San Mateo yesterday. I did talk to him, but he went ixnay on that program, eh? So I've done the tourism stuff, and we'll just talk to you about wine. Um, as I said before, 10 of the countries in South America produce wine, the two that don't being uh, Guyana and uh, Suriname. But every other country produces wine and produces it commercially. So um, I won't tell you that all the wines are spectacular. I wouldn't rush out and make a beeline trip to get wines out of Paraguay and Colombia per se. But if you were interested in doing it, and if you find yourself locally, believe it or not, you will actually be able to find local wine from all of those places. Um, what's really interesting to do it, and we'll focus really in on the four tonight. By the way, segue, I will tangent all evening. You do have six wines from four countries uh, in front of you tonight. Um, this is not only to thank you for coming, uh, but also to bring it to life, if you will. Um, I tried to talk to a couple of my empanada friends, but that didn't work either. They must be hanging out with Rick Steves. I don't know. What can I tell you? But you have six wines there. We will take them and taste them along the way as we get to the individual countries from where they're from, but that shouldn't stop you from imbibing. So you should feel free to drink and listen drink and talk, drink and all that other good stuff. The other thing I just wanted to make mention of the fact is that although I'll certainly um, put aside and dedicate a Q&A period, uh, a good sizable one at the end for everybody, if you do have the proverbial uh, burning question, you know, the Mr. Cotta, oh, 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 that kind of question along, thank you for remembering Mr. Cotta, right? Uh, but if you have a question along the way, please feel free, throw your hand up in the air. I'd be more than happy to answer it. You know, we're, I'm not one of those people that uh, gets really freaked out when that happens. If I do start twitching, it's, it's for probably because I'm in the witness protection program. It has nothing to do with wine. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, about uh, wine. I would suggest to you right off the bat before we go anywhere that outside of Europe, continentally, South America is probably the most important wine continent. Yes, North America is important but we're sort of dominated by our one big country here in the good old U.S. of A. with things to the north in Canada and things to the south in Mexico. Yes, Australia is doing a lot of stuff, but it's certainly a, a nation continent, if you will. Uh, there's a few things dribbling and dabbling in, in Africa, most notably what's going on in South Africa, what's happening in North Africa and Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, and bits and pieces along the way. Big cheers for Lake Naivasha and Kenya, a good producer of wine. But uh, not much else really going on there. Europe certainly does a big job. But I would say really South America, by virtue of having 10 continentally producing nations, and two of which are amongst the most significant to U.S. wine sales, certainly, and sales along around the world, it does sort of claim that uh, particular uh, mantle. It also is home to very happy people. I was reading a, a Gallup poll in uh, December that said, uh, it was a 2012 poll that came out only last year. Go figure that one. But it stated that seven of the world's 10 most upbeat countries are in South America. So that must have to do with the fact that they drink so much wine. <laughs> A uh, little history of the grape before we get started. It's probably, um, well, maybe it's not a surprise to all of you, but as we all know, um, as you travel around and you go back in time through history, things moved a lot uh, in terms of foods, cultures, all sorts of other things. And grapes themselves are actually not native to South America. This is the continent that gave you chocolate, it gave you potatoes, it gave you tomatoes, and those went around the world, but they didn't actually have any grapes of their own. So the grapes came in via other people. Um, and namely, it came in through two sort of segues. Uh, both of which uh, really had to do probably with the Spanish more than anything. The first round, actually both of them were in the late 15th century, but the first round came in through the north in what was called New Spain. We call it sort of the Mexican California territory today. And uh, that was through the uh, Spanish conquistadores that came through. It was not pretty, needless to say. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. This is an upbeat conversation. We're not going to talk about the negativity around the world. But uh, they came down uh, in, the, in the late 15th century and they essentially conquered what is today modern-day Peru, uh, modern-day Bolivia, northern Chile, and northern Argentina. The Argentina thing actually spread a little bit further because the Argentinians kind of rolled over, whereas uh, when they got into Chile, the Chileans, and specifically the Mapuche, fought back pretty hard and, and stopped them in their tracks. But um, they came down. They brought the grapes with them. The grapes they brought were actually Spanish grapes. And uh, for those of you who followed California viticulture, you know that our 
uh, culture was really started on a singular grape, the so-called Pais or Mission grape, or the Criolla Chica grape that we know of today. And that was certainly one of the most important. But they brought other grapes with them, a whole slew of which um, are not really seen that much today. We still see the Pais grape uh, in Chile, or the uh, Criolla Chica grape, as it's known in Argentina. But a number of the other grapes have sort of fallen off and out of favor. And one, they don't produce particularly delicious wine. Grapes like Molar, Nuvina, and Torontal, which are generally distilled uh, for Pisco in Peru and Chile, and for Singani in Bolivia. And other grapes that actually have stuck, namely the Pais grape, as I said before, but probably the most well-known of all of the Criolla, or Crioja, if you were in Argentina, grapes that we talked about today is the Torrentes grape. And the Torrentes grape, of which there are three distinctly different grapes that all share uh, the, pr the, the prefix of Torrentes, but they are three different grapes, one each in San Juan, in uh, Salta, uh, Rioja area, and then one in, in, uh, in Mendocino, M Mendoza, are all part of this original uh, Criolla grape thing as well, too. So they came, they spread uh, along, as, as we, uh, we talked about before, it really got started in Peru, and it was due to all the Peruvian advents, frankly, in uh, aqueducts and water movement that actually allowed grapes and irrigation to happen, because these places are particularly dry, as many of you know, a lot of it's high desert, and um, things started happening. So that piece was going on there. Then at the same time as they started to uh, venture out and start uh, um, putting down missionaries and things there, you had a whole nother wave that came through, and it came through in sort of two places. You had the first wave that basically came in uh, through Chile and helped settle places like Santiago and all that. Combination of the missionaries reaching the uh, conquistadors as they went south. And Chile was really probably more essential to the uh, advent of quote unquote table wine and fine wine uh, uh, producing better and better quality over time, even though from a volume standpoint, Peru was the capital. Um, and then it came in as well through on the other side where it was brought in through some of the, uh, the other uh, navigators coming through Portugal and places like that that brought it into to, uh, Brazil and along the way. So all this happened in the 1500s. So fast forward a little bit, wine culture was going on. As I said before, wine culture wasn't particularly well known for wine, and actually the distillates uh, really were, were the drivers uh, because the people who were doing a lot of the drinking early on um, before the, uh, the, the 17th and uh, 18th centuries uh, were folks who were basically doing mining work, and they were doing it up in Peru, they were doing it in Bolivia, and uh, they enjoyed their drink to keep them warm when it got really cold in the winter. However, they didn't find that the wine did the ticket, and I don't know if that was because of taste or not enough alcohol by volume, but needless to say, distillation arrived and you resulted in Pisco uh, and you resulted in Singani and Bolivia, both of which kept the miners a lot warmer than drinking their otherwise fairly mediocre wine. From a qualitative standpoint, um, wine didn't really change that much until realistically, um, gosh, I want to say probably about the, 17, the 1700s or so, when uh, people started traveling around. And, in, uh, and, and what you started to see was people who made their mining, money in mining, specifically in Chile, uh, find their way over to Europe. And, uh, and what they did specifically, as we spoke to uh, with Chile, they went around, these people had money, and they uh, went to Paris. They thought that was really cool. They went down to Bordeaux, and they would go, I'll have one of those. People not knowing what they meant, but they actually meant, I'll have a chateau. So you had this entire culture that came back in the 1600s, and people started saying, we're going to do this. But needless to say, they came back, they went back to Santiago, and they settled in. Now, one of the things that's important to remember with the spread of grapes and the spread of wine in culture over over time is that they didn't have all the cool stuff that we have today. There were no such things as tanker trucks, much less cars. There were no such thing as flying winemakers and things like that. So you basically had to do what you, what you had uh, locally. So in that case, the people that came back and moved back to Santiago said, where should I plant? And they decided, well, I should plant as in good areas as I can, but basically as far as a horse and buggy is essentially going to take me. So if you look at the uh, the direction and the build of the Chilean wine industry, it's pretty much in what we refer to as the Central Valley today. And that Central Valley area is basically around and to the east of uh, Santiago, and that's basically as far as you could get. So they planted there. That's not to say all the great wines uh, are coming from there, but that actually got them started. So that'll give us a good little segue and a sense of how we uh, begin our, our, our journey before we get uh, going. So I want to talk first about Argentina. 
Now, Arjun, I'm not going to go necessarily A, B, C, D. I'm going to go in, uh, in, 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 in volume importance. Argentina is, is without question the big dog as far as wine goes in South America. It is actually decreed the national beverage in 2010 uh, by Christina Kirshner, who went in and with a proclamation recognized uh, the role of that. And anybody who has wine as their national beverage can't be all bad, right? Um, it's a fairly large country, as we know. The wine area runs essentially 1,000 miles from north to south from Jujuy down into Patagonia. And it's defined a lot by altitude. Most of all these areas are in the so-called high desert until you get far in the south in Patagonia, with the lion's share of the wine regions being somewhere in the low areas around 2,500 feet, going up in the very far north to about 7,000, 8,000 feet, which sounds like a lot until you get to Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, where it gets even higher and higher, places that have average close to 9,000 feet above sea level for latitude. Um, they are the fifth largest wine producer in the world, and when I say that, I say grape wine, because if you actually look at these things, China is the fifth largest producer of wine in the world. Did anyone know that? Right, that's true, but they include rice wine within that. So if you subtract rice wine out of that, that drops them down and actually puts the Argentines uh, up, at, uh, up at fifth and not, not sixth per se. Um, they're the fourth largest exporter to the United States after Italy, Australia, and France. And unlike their neighbors, they drink a ton of wine. Um, there's only two countries in the, on the continent that I would say are serious imbibers. One would be Argentina, and when we get to it a little bit later, the other one would be Uruguay. Um, they drank a lot less now than they used to. At one point, they were drinking 90 liters per person, per capita. Today, it's down to about 26 or 27. Why was wine consumed in such quantity? One, um, it made the non-potable water look really good, <laughs> or not so good. And two, just there were less choices around. One of the reasons you're seeing wine consumption decline in many parts of the world today is people have choice. They can drink Red Bull. They could drink Coca-Cola. They can drink beer. They can drink cider. They can drink a number of other things where they didn't have those options before. And people, most notably younger people, uh, coming out of Argentina, you're finding are drinking less and less wine. But still, they're drinking 26 liters per person per capita. And when you've got 41 million people in the country, good number of those being legal drinking age, you do the math, it adds up pretty healthily. The other thing that's important to remember is for as much of that wine as they make, and they are the leaders there, they actually drink a lot. They are not necessarily as dependent on exporting as other countries are. For example, the Chileans export 70% of what they produce. The Argentines export probably about 35 to 40% in a, in, a, in a high year of what they're doing. So they enjoy drinking a lot. Uh, the wine of choice, and then we'll get to tasting a couple of them in a few minutes. The wines of choice today are not going to be what you would expect. When you go to the supermarket, when you go to the wine store, what you probably buy is Malbec, right? Most of us do. And if you're buying white, you're buying Torrentes. Maybe you're buying a little bit of Bonarda or blended together or Cabernet, et cetera, et cetera. If you go down to that part of the world, which I encourage you to do, Buenos Aires is a spectacularly wonderful city with lots of cool stuff to do. And Mendoza, if you're into wine, is a place worth going to. They have a wine trail that has some 170 wineries on it. They see just south of 700,000 people a year, which I know is nothing when you compare that to how many people go to Baron German Davi. But for South America, that's a lot of folks, all right? Um, and they really do it well. They actually do it, do it quite well there. So, um, but they don't drink necessarily of all this wine that isn't exported, you're saying, I see a lot of it exported, but a lot of it's drunk locally, and a lot of it's produced out of these same Criolla grapes that we saw before. So you're seeing a lot of Criolla grapes, a lot of other types of grapes, Cereza, you see uh, Criolla Chica, Criolla Grande, things like that, Torontel, grown and consumed locally, generally um, in volume, out of demijohns, in boxes, things like that that your average Argentinian person drinks at home. They're not expensive. They're not particularly life-changing either, I might add, but they do form the backbone of the industry. Um, what's interesting about the Argentinians, and if you haven't, if you have, has anybody here been to Argentina before? You go to Ar what? You guys are better, better world travelers than virtually everybody I know. My God, um, you go to Argentina. What you'll probably notice is the preponderance, not only within the wine industry, but within the culture itself, is despite the fact that it's Spanish-speaking. And despite the fact that it's called the Paris of South America, and if you go down the Grand Boulevards, looks a bit Hausmannish and Parisian at that, um, most people there consider themselves Italian. 
Italian first. In fact, the heritage of Argentina is about 70% Italian. Now, you ask yourself, well, Evan, why would that be? Well, let me ask, let me answer. Well, Evan, why would that be? Well, Argentina, as well as Brazil, as well as Chile, as well as Uruguay, all of the southern part of the continent essentially was established by homesteading. Um, when people were, were, uh, were trying to figure out how to get out in the late, late 1800s from Europe, fleeing persecution, fleeing Depression-era economics and all that, they basically got on boats, as we all know. A lot of those boats went to Ellis Island in New York, right? A lot of you probably have relatives that came through there. A lot of the other boats went down to South America. Why? Because South America desperately needed people. There was nobody there once you got outside of the big cities. So what they basically said was that if you come here and you settle some of these areas that are relatively barren at this point in time, we'll essentially give you the land in return for sticking it out and sticking around. So a lot of people, specifically the Italians in the case of Argentina, came there and worked their way north and slowly worked their way south, which is why you'll notice a couple things when you go to Argentina. Virtually, hmm, I won't put a number to it, but the majority of wine producers there have Italian last names. You'll notice that the majority of people there, when they're not eating meat, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, are probably eating pasta or pizza, and they, in their heart of hearts, in their souls, they consider themselves to be Italians, and they actually are. They came primarily from the north and came over during this period of time. So a lot of Italians in, in Argentina. Um, and that has reflected not only in the fact that... Uh, the wineries have Italian names and all that, but they brought wine culture with them. Um, as they moved right and left with them, right and uh, south and north with them, um, they would bring wine with them. They would plant grapes. They would use what was there over time. Obviously, trade brought in other grapes and such, but it actually added to the dynamic that makes up the wine culture today. And what they found was that although they didn't need to pay people a lot, people would gladly take pay in wine. Um, as I said before, the wine was a lot healthier to drink than the water, and um, it was part of their culture, so they grew it. The biggest single thing that happened to Argentina that put them on the map was in the uh, 1800s when they um, connected Mendoza, which was the center of wine, to uh, Buenos Aires when the railroad was uh, completed, probably the most significant date, which you can read about in the book uh, when you get the book a little bit later on. All right. Uh, what else can I tell you? Argentina is about 80% red. Uh, they produce some white wine. Most all of us think that that's uh, all Torrentes. It's not. They grow some Chardonnay. They grow some Sauvignon Blanc. And they grow a lot of these sort of basic white wines. They'll take red grapes and vinify them into white, inexpensive wines for their own consumption as well. And they enjoy eating and they enjoy drinking. Um, you will be hard-pressed to find two things in Argentina. One, a person who doesn't enjoy eating at table. They are amongst the best table mates you will ever have. Two, a vegetarian. <laughs> okay, it is really difficult to be a vegetarian in Argentina. And I would add, it's very difficult to be an Argent uh, a vegetarian in Uruguay and in probably in southern Brazil, actually most of Brazil as well too. People there eat, are you sitting down, 150 pounds of beef per person, per capita, per year. I know you're probably sitting there feeling your arteries harden <laughs> as you speak, but they need something to go with all that Malbec, right? Yeah. Also Argentinian beef, Uruguayan beef, uh, uh, Brazilian beef is quite, quite good. But Mendoza itself is an incredibly healthy region. Uh, they are very, the, that is the, the ag basket of uh, that, of Argentina um, that produces uh, not only incredible wine, but they're the second largest producers of garlic in the world. After China, they grow peaches that will make you um, swoon, um, incredible vegetables, and all sorts of other stuff, as well as obviously the vineyards. Two-thirds of, of Argentina's vineyards sit in Mendoza, which when you add it with San Juan, just to the north, gives you about 90% of the vineyards in the entire country. Although you can continue all the way to the north and go into Salta and Jujuy, further, uh, further uh, to the very, very north of the country, and then way down into Patagonia in the south and find wine grown virtually everywhere. But that is really the most important region. Um, all of the wines in Argentina are irrigated. Um, this is essentially the high desert, as I said before. Uh, there is a, uh, a rain shadow, not that there's a lot of wine, by the way, that comes, uh, rain rather, that comes across Chile, but whatever is there really drops itself at the Andes, and when you go across the Andes, it is dry as a bone. So what they do is essentially work off of the river, which are replenished through snowmelt, through their aquifers, and through um, uh, reservoirs that they create through that to essentially irrigate as necessary there. So um, if you like sun, 
Well, if you like sun being California these days, it doesn't seem to rain anymore. But if you like even more sun than we get here, you can go to Mendoza. Uh, it's said that they get 350 to 352 days, depending on who you read, days of sunshine per year. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, let's go ahead and taste a couple of the wines that we have. So if you haven't uh, gone done so already, we're going to jump down to the bottom row. We have two reds. It makes sense that they're, uh, that they're both uh, Argentinian uh, wines. Um, and uh, actually, we only have one Argentine wine today. Well, shish kebab. We, ju we just did that. Okay, go to wine number four. It is our Argentinian wine of the day. I was in Chicago last week. We had three Argentinian wines, so I'm uh, trying to figure out where we are. Anyway, this wine uh, is from the Vistalba Winery. This wine sits in Mendoza, specifically in the area of Luján de Cujo, uh, which is essentially right around um, the area of Mendoza proper. Uh, the area of Mendoza proper is broken up in two uh, primary regions. One is called Aluján de Cuyo. Cuyo means land of sand and is essentially the area that refers to Greater Mendoza and to San Juan and La Rioja to the further north. Luján would be the name of the town from which it takes its name, but it's better known as sort of the geographic region around Mendoza. The other one being Maipú, with a U not to be confused with Maipo over in Chile that we see earlier. Uh, this winery uh, is owned by Carlos Pulenta, not Polenta, but Pulenta, one of the great families of, uh, of uh, that part of the world, and um, it's a blend. So what you're going to find in Argentina, the more time you spend there, um, and the more time you enjoy being there is that uh, they'll get you, they'll hook you in, they'll bring you in, they will reel you in with their varietal Malbec wines, but the wines that they are generally the most proud of, as by the way, people in Bordeaux would be, as we are very oftentimes in the United States, are their blends. If you see the term corte, C-O-R-T-E, on a label of his Spanish-speaking as opposed to Portuguese-speaking wine, that simply means cut or blend. And the best wines, the Argentinians will tell you, are their blended wines. This particular wine is a blend of 80% Malbec and 20% Cabernet Sauvignon. So what do the two of them do? Malbec uh, is probably the great most synonymous with Argentina. And very happy in Argentina. Malbec means, in French, where the grape comes from, mal, bad, bec, mouth bad mouth. So if you think about it going back a long, long time ago, the reality is that Bordeaux and Argentina are two very different places. As we sort of alluded to earlier, doesn't rain much in Argentina. Got to irrigate everything. Rains a lot in France. Rains a particularly lot in southwest France. Means that the Malbec isn't going to get what? As much sun, as much phenolic development, as ripe. Okay, that's number one. Number two, it, you're generally dealing with vineyards that are much lower vis-a-vis -vis altitude than you're dealing with Argentina, which is much higher as altitude. When you're dealing with vineyards that are higher, it's less what? It's less wet. You have less rot. You have less disease. And being higher altitude, the grapes actually adapt to a much different ultraviolet situation, develop thicker skins, which gives them more color. The phenols develop well, so you don't get any of those gritty, astringent tannins that you find often, hence giving the term Malbec, bad mouth. And you get a lot more of the development of the aromatics, the violets, the dark fruit character that you're going to find in Argentina, changing as you go from the north to the south that you're simply not going to find there. So Malbec is perfectly suited for Argentina, not so much for France. In fact, the French are sort of rethinking the way they produce Malbec in Caor and the other areas by one, um, blending it in different ways, but two, thinking about one, labeling it differently. If you bought any French Malbec recently, you'll notice it all says Malbec on the label, right? They didn't used to do that, but the people don't know. That's one of the problems with European wines you buy. People just assume. It comes from here, you know what it's made of. You know what the reality is? The Europeans don't know what it's made of 90% of the time, too. So anyway, but if you drink that, so you're going to get a much more developed character. And then Cabernet is a good blending grape, but it doesn't ripen every year in Argentina. So obviously in the Cortes, your Cabernet percentage is going gonna, is gonna, to... Um, uh, be a lot more um, judicious and really only in ripe years. And when it does ripen best, it generally ripens in Luján de Cujo. So this is, I think, a lovely wine. This is their Corte C, which means they make an A and a B as well, too. And this is their, um, one of my favorite just house wines, delightfully affordable, always well scored and critically acclaimed wine. This wine sells for 14 bucks. You tell me what you can buy $14 from California these days that gives one as much pleasure as you do there. So viva the Argentinians. 
Hopefully they'll get their economy back together. <laughs> Poor guys. If you go down to Argentina, by the way, is anyone planning on going to Argentina? Thinking about it. Inspired to go to Argentina after you're talking to me. Absolutely go. Bring U.S. dollars because you go to the stores. Even you go to some of the restaurants. There are three prices. Price number one, Argentinian peso price. Price number two, US, U.S. dollar price. Price number three, well, actually credit card price I should have started, which is low because they have to pay everybody. They get a bit, uh, uh, cash price, which means peso, which is higher, and U.S. dollar price, which is the best. The U.S. dollar, if you can trade in dollars and you're comfortable with cash, you're, you can get literally three times the going rate right now, maybe four if you're actually paying in dollars than if you pay in pesos, and certainly not with a credit card. And if you go and you can track down one of these so-called money-changing banks, get a good one, you go in, you're, it's, it's, I swear to God, it's like out of a film noir movie. You go in, you ring a little bell, you knock on the door, there's a, you know, it's like in a mall and there's like three security guards with guns out there. And you walk, and eventually somebody comes in, they whisk you into a little room, you walk there, you just give them the cash, they don't say anything, and they give you back literally four and a half times um, what the exchange rate is because they need the dollars in Argentina. So it's a great place to go if you're us right now. It's not good if you're them. Anyway. That's enough about Argentina. Needless to say, there are other great wines there. We've tasted one, but for whites, they're wonderful, tropical, flavorful. Torrentes wines are worth trying, and they're Bonarda wines, which is sort of their local grape, uh, essentially the same as our Charbono grape here, are worth trying as well. So a couple of words there. And um, I'll talk more about beef later. By the way, if you're, do you love, anybody here love empanadas? If you love empanadas, this is your country to go to. There are 17 different kinds of empanadas produced regionally throughout this country. And there's actually, um, the, you can go to talk to people and they'll talk about the different, some fried, some baked. By the way, they do not have a monopoly on empanadas. Empanadas are made in every single country in uh, South America, but they probably do more regional uh, specialties of them. And there's one place you can go to in the north called Tucumán. And Tucumán is not particularly memorable for its wines, but they actually have a Ruta de la Empanada. And you can go to 60 different places and have to, it's like they've got a map. It's like, you know how you get your map here, where to go in the Napa Valley? You go for, you know, say, can I have the empanada map? And you just go hit temp empanada places all day. It's really cool. Anyway, all right, enough about Argentina. Uh, let's talk next about Chile. Uh, Chile is not nearly as big as Argentina uh, in terms of people. You have about 41 pe million people, we said, in Argentina. You've got less than half that in Chile. There's only about 17 and a half million. Uh, the country is much smaller. It's very shaped differently, too. First of all, the Andes sort of bifurcate the entire continent. The Chileans, if you spend any time there, you'll notice from a personality perspective, are very different than everybody else. Every other continent, every other country on the continent, every sort of stereotypical thing of passionate, emotional, off the collar, crazy people in wonderful way, but hot-tempered people you will find throughout South America. Apparently, the Chileans didn't get the memo because when they had to settle over on that side, they're sort of, I wouldn't call them cold by any stretch of the imagination, but they lack that sort of fire and intensity that they do, which makes them a bit more serious you know, they're really good business people. They have by far and away the healthiest ongoing economy. They're in healthiest government, a most stable government today that you're going to find along with that of Uruguay. But they're very, very different. They are the ninth largest producer of wine globally. So you drop a couple of notches after our friends in Argentina. Yet the fifth largest exporter of wines to the United States just after Argentina. So for a small little country... They do a really good job in the export market. Why? They're good business people. They have more free trade agreements set up around the world than any other country. When you go traveling around, you'll be probably not surprised at how much Chilean wine you will find on the market. Why? Free trade. They do a really, really good job of it. Um, they export, as I said before, about 70% of what's produced today. And the lion's share of what is made today increasingly is going to be made from uh, uh, what we would call Wine grapes, vinifera grapes. Now let's go back to that period of time I was talking to you about when the Europeans or the French came over. France and Chile have a very long, um, mutually beneficial relationship together. The Chileans went over, brought back a lot when free trade started going on. They came back, they started planting grapes. They brought over French winemakers. Um, and if you go to, to uh, Chile, what you'll notice is that unlike... Um, 
uh, Argentina, which except for Malbec, has really settled in on a range of other grapes that are, are, are different in style from different countries. It's really about European grapes and you're really about French grapes in Chile, most notably Cabernet Sauvignon, which is by far the most planted red grape in the country, although most of us oftentimes associate it with what other grape that comes from nearby. Carmenere, which is the signature grape of the country, although planted in a much less uh, lower quantity. Both Chile and Argentina share the sort of magical trait that both countries are essentially quote-unquote phylloxera-free. So everyone familiar with phylloxera, that wonderful little bug that chews on grapevines until they go uncle and you have to replant them in time? Well, you don't have it in Chile at all. It was never, it was never brought over and they've really managed to keep it out. There are little bits and pockets there, but it's not a pervasive problem. You actually do have phylloxera in Argentina, but for a number of reasons, the phylloxera bug itself doesn't finish its life cycle, so it never comes above ground to then go back to actually cause any damage because they flood irrigate in Argentina, and um, that stops it. So the, the, the Argentinians feel no need to talk about it, whereas I'm sure if you've ever talked to a Chilean winemaker, one of the first things they tell you is what? We have no phylloxera, which is a cool thing. It means you can plant your grapes directly into the ground, and many things are on their own roots in Chile, and they are in Argentina. What they actually do when they're planting, more often than not, especially in the non-well-funded, more rustic vineyards that you have, is they do a process called mugron, M-U-G-R-O-N, which they essentially take a cane and run it off of the vine directly into the ground and start a new vine from that. And when that vine takes hold, they, move, they get rid of the other vine over there. So you're essentially continually planting on your own roots. What that means is that in Argentina and in Chile and in all of South America, if you think about it, what happened was um, grape stalks, root, roots, uh, vines were brought over from Europe pre phylloxera Phylloxera hit Europe and devastated the vineyards. So actually among the purest stock for grapes in the world is South American stock. And if you can get a Bordelais nursery guy really, really drunk over dinner one night and you ask them about it, they will tell you that people are actually importing back Malbec and Carmenere and actually a little bit of Petit Verdot too from South America back into Europe because one, they have better plant material diversity and two, it's original healthy pre phylloxera rootstock. You have to get them drunk. They're not going to tell you this otherwise, okay? But I, you heard it from me. They're definitely doing it. So uh, let's go back to Chile. So you have Cabernet there. You have Carmenere as their grape. And uh, they were planting it. So there are vineyards that have a lot of age, uh, along with, again, Pais uh, and, to a lesser degree, Sanso that was planted to impre improve the quality of the Pais, right, uh, in the Central Valley a long period of time ago. But it really wasn't until most countries when individuals came in and sort of changed the way people think. In the case of Argentina, some of you have spent some time studying um, Argentinian wines, are probably well aware of the story of Nicolas Catena. His daughter Laura lives in town, is probably a friend of several of yours. And, the Catena, and Nicolas Catena came over here in the 70s, went to school at Berkeley, spent virtually every weekend up in the wine country, hanging out with Bob Mandavi and all that, and went back home and said, we can do better and really was the catalyst for the quality of improvement in Argentinian wines today. It can be traced literally to a single man and literally traced, obviously, with help. Paul Hobbs from California and a number of other people helped out. Michelle Roland and the yeah, charts were doing stuff at the same time. And in the case of uh, Chile, it was really thanks to Mich Miguel Torres of Spanish fame who went over there in 1979 at the bequest of a friend of his who had also gone to school at UC Davis who said you should come down here and took a look at it and went, Wow, this is pretty good. These conditions here are awfully amazing. If they had better equipment, if they had better plant material, if they spent some time reducing yields and improving quality, they could make some really good wine. So he sort of put his... Uh, his uh, his stake in the, his, I guess, spade in the ground, his shovel in the ground, and started doing that, and that essentially started the quality movement. Other people followed, again, both uh, people from outside the country, as well as quality-focused people inside the country, people such as Aurelio Montez, who many of you have probably heard of before, who helped drive, uh, from the internal standpoint, what was going on there, and the quality started to improve. 
So on top of quality improvement, what you ended up happening was three other things going on. One, the Chileans, again, probably due to their professional focused, very myopic nature, went in and said, there's got to be more to this stuff than just, you know, planting grapes. So they actually were the first people to really go in and do serious soil analysis. And what I would tell you is if you ever go to a vineyard in Chile where a gentleman by the name of Pedro Para, who is sort of the terroir, the dirt whisperer, of South America has gone in. He will literally go in and put different stakes in where in the vineyards, the, uh, the vineyards change. Because literally, you think about it, they have um, alluvial, colluvial, they've got all this stuff, volcanic, all these things going on, the most diverse soils that you find. You can literally go in and find eight, 10, 12 different soil types in a single vineyard. They understand today how to work these soil types and to plant the best grape varieties there. So that's a big deal. The Argentinians will tell you, well, we've got really good soil too, but they really only have one kind, sort of a sandy uh, loam type soil, which they call Franco, F-R-A-N-C-O, that has nothing to do with that horrific general, by the way, zero to do, all right? Um, but they, so, the Argent, so the Chileans have that, and they've really good, done a good job of identifying, uh, planting, working with it. The second thing that they have is um, incredible viticulture. They are really, if you look at one country that has sort of driven the biodynamic, organic, sustainable movement in South America, by the way, does not translate to all of their vegetables, but it's certainly doing the fact in the grapes, uh, that would be Chile as well too, led by the um, absolutely irascible Alvaro Espinosa, who's doing a, an amazing job there. So they've got all that going going on. And then the third thing they've done is they've expanded their territories. So although certainly the great, what we call the Great Central Valley, which includes the Maipo Valley, the Rappel Valley, where you have uh, Colchagua, a place like that, and the Maule, which is the big driver of volume there, are certainly responsible for the lion's share of what's produced in Chile. They are going up north there are people actually doing projects just uh, outside of the Atacama with irrigated grapes, but certainly more in Coquimbo, in El Quí, in Limarí, in Chihuahua. There's some really neat things going on where they used to think only volume wines could be produced. And way far south as you go down towards Punta Arenas, getting into next stop uh, penguins and things like that, they're doing some really cool things in Mayeco, Bio Bio, Traigen, and even Osorno these days. So they've really, really ventured out. The first effort with that probably being done by many of you have heard of an area called Casablanca. Yes? Not Humphrey Bogart. Casablanca, the wine region. Um, this was really the first cool wine region to be discovered in the late 70s by Pablo Morandé. He was working with Conchitoro at the time and really started doing that after he came to California, went back and said, this place reminds me of like the Russian River or, you know, the Carneros. They've got this influx of fog. It goes out in the middle of the day. Everybody told him he was an idiot, that it was too cold. You needed the warmth of the Central Valley. He quit Conchidoro, went out, put his money where his mouth was, started doing some things on his own, and the rest, as they say, is history. So never underestimate the, 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 the reality of those particular things. So let's taste a wine or two. Um, let's go pick up your glass number two. This is a Chilean wine. Uh, both of the wines they are provided by my, uh, my good buddies over at Conchitoro. Conchitoro is an amazing winery because it is the biggest wine company by far in all of Chile. And they are responsible for some very nice kind of everyday drinking wines, but they're also responsible for amongst some of the best and most expensive wines produced throughout the country. Probably the biggest icon wine in Chile is a wine called Don Melchor, uh, which is produced by Conchi Toro, and they also make Casillero Diablo, which is a volume wine from around the world. This is um, part of their, uh, uh, a new, actually it's a new line of wines from them, that they're sort of isolating single vineyards in particular areas. This one happens to come from the Rappel, and um, it's specifically from, let me get my notes out here, I don't want to give you the wrong information, that would be bad, Evan, bad. Uh, this is from the uh, Usu, uh, Ucuquer vineyard in Colchagua, um, and it comes off of granite, uh, granite and granitic and clay loam soils, and uh, with excellent drainage, beautiful acidity, a cooler area of uh, Colchagua, so it's not in the warmer areas. Again, this whole exploration in the new territories. And what I think is probably for me, as somebody who's been drinking Chilean Chardonnay for a long period of time, um, most memorable about this is it just doesn't taste like, okay, it's kind of nice. For years, Chardonnay coming out of Chile, frankly, a lot of the Cabernet coming out of Chile was kind of nice wine. You know, it was kind of like, you know, okay, I get as much pleasure out of that as I do a uh, bowl of vanilla ice cream, right? Simple cheese sandwich or something like that. Correct. 
but not interesting. And as they're spending more time pushing out some of these edgier uh, vineyards in these cooler areas, you're starting to see more and more of that happen. So it's very much like our movement to the Sonoma uh, Sonoma Coast or into Marin County and into some of the cooler areas there. They've been doing that as well. So uh, this wine um, has been spent nine months in oak, 100% uh, Chardonnay. Um, and again, Chardonnay being the second most planted white wine grape uh, by a lot after Sauvignon Blanc. Again, thinking about uh, not only the, 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 the lineage that the country has in Sauvignon Blanc, but also the reality that it has a long time um, coming back to Bordeaux. So, uh, but this is one of their more recent efforts in Chardonnay, and I think it's a good job. The other flip side of that, uh, if you go to the last wine, is the other is a red wine, and this comes from the Tingirica, uh, also um, not too far outside of uh, Colchagua. Get my notes on that one as well too, so I'm giving you correct information. Ah, Too many pieces of paper, Evan. Okay, this comes from the area specifically called Marchique. This is an area that I would be looking out for on the label. It's spelled M-A-R-C-H-I-G-U-E. This is a up-and-coming little hot spot of what they call Coastal Colchagua, where not only the best, uh, many of the best white wines are coming in subregions uh, like Lolol and Paredones, but a lot of the great red wines are coming as well too. This wine is 90% Cabernet, 10% uh, Carmenere, and it comes from the Palo Santo. So again, another single vineyard wine uh, from the Dio of Marchique within uh, the Colchagua Valley. Um, red clay soil, so that Terra Rosa with a sub uh, subterra of granite once again. I think um, a good example, appropriately peppery and good red fruit. Good flavor, and both of these wines, you will be pleased to know, set you back about 15 bucks. You tell me $15 Cabernet, Napa Valley, what you're going to get for $15. Ah, kind of scary, Evan. All right, let's move to Brazil next. <laughs> Brazil is a big country. We all know that. Brazil literally covers just, just three percentage points less than half the continent. It is 47% of the continent. It is the fifth largest uh, population base in the world at 210 million, and it is the fifth largest continent in the world in terms of sheer area as well, too. Um, it's got an industry of wine that goes back a long time as well, too. There are 1,100 wineries in the country of Brazil. You'd never know any of this, would you? There was not anything written about the Brazilian wine industry until this book. It's absolutely amazing to me. Uh, their industry goes back again to those settlers. Remember I was talking to you about um, that went in the Italian, specifically into the state of Rio Grande do Sul, which is the southernmost state in Brazil and the state of which Wine Central is all about. And um, the people who went there were again primarily Italians and they went uh, getting into Porto Alegre, the port area. They went north into this area called the Serra Gaucha, which is the primary uh, wine production area that was there. Uh, Brazil, southern Brazil, if I were to pick you up from nowhere and spin you around until you were really dizzy and drop you on the ground in southern Brazil and nobody said a word, you would think you were in Europe. People there are either German, Polish, or Italian. The Italians all went up to Serra Gaucha to produce wine. The Poles stayed around Porto Alegre, did baking and all sorts of other good stuff. And the Germans are primarily the furniture makers, and they stayed around Porto Alegre and went about as far north as Alto Feliz. Um, they were no German winemakers. I asked people that. Well, didn't that. How come nobody brought Riesling here? They only brought wood. They just wanted to make uh, <laughs> furniture. I don't know. So anyway, uh, the Italians came there, they started producing grapes, but because of their relatives and such who had landed in North America, you can imagine that there was a lot of trade uh, between North America and South America. It would seem logical. The grapes that they first brought with them on the boats, their Italian grapes, when they planted them in southern Brazil with the humidity, with the, uh, with the irregular temperatures that they have, and southern Brazil is awfully cool. Um, it is not what you think of like the beaches of Bahia and Salvador and Rio de Janeiro. You're pretty far south, and the average temperatures are more 60s to 70s. gets a little bit 80-ish in the, in the summer, maybe a 90 here or there, and it gets in the 50s in the winter. It rains. It reminds you of Bordeaux weather-wise oftentimes in the winter. And they planted their grapes. They didn't do so well. So the people came down from New York. New York, probably Long Island, right? Actually, they did come from Long Island. And they brought them out there and they brought their other grapes with them. They go, ah, oh, these grapes are not doing so good, huh? They, ah, we have grapes that we brought from North America. They do really good because they were the Native American grapes. And they said, not only will they tolerate some of your more difficult temp, your uh, more difficult weather, you can also make jam out of them. Oh, cannot do that with our grapes. You can also make juice out of them. Ah, oh, 
We need fruit juice. We can't do that with our grapes. You can make you can make jellies. You can make all sorts of stuff. So not only were the grapes more regularly uh, pr pr providing, but they had multiple uses. So that is why to the day when you go down to Brazil and you move further south to Uruguay, the lion's share of what's actually produced is being made using Concord, Niagara, Delaware, Bordeaux, Isabella, and every other grape that you fled from in New York a long time ago. Okay, you can find them happily growing down there in Brazil. But those are divided because they are what we call vinho comun, vinho, as opposed to vinho fino, which is the fine wine, which is the result of the 1970s when the French and the Italians came in trying to figure out how you're going to make money in Brazil and said, we need to do some stuff here. And the Brazilians said, we're all open. How would we make better wine? We want to be a serious player. They're not serious players in the world of wine at that point in time. Probably not yet either. But aspirationally, what can we do? We said, well, if you want to be made taken seriously, you need to make red wines like Bordeaux. So they started planning, you know, Merlot, which did well in their climate because it's a cooler climate grape and it can handle some of the funkier weather. They planted Cabernet, not so interesting, but there's some pockets where it does well, especially down in Frontera. They planted other grapes that were the Semillon, things like that. And they also made sparkling wine. Why? Because the, the Chandon people, Moet and Chandon, has an outpost every single place in the world. And the Chandon people got to Brazil early, as they did to Argentina early. Chandon, Argentina is a big frickin' monster. That's a big company. Making some, by the way, very good wine, sparkling and still. And they said, you need to make sparkling wine. Well, the Brazilians took that to heart. And in fact, one of the things you'll notice if you do get down to Brazil is probably their biggest single competitive advantage is all of the dizzying array of sparkling wine that they make. You can get Moscatos and sparkling Moscatos that rival Asti for a lot less money and are a lot better. You know, Asti, they push out volumes. You can actually get wine labeled Prosecco made from the same grape Glera that the Brazilians got a dispensation on along with the Australians. Go figure that. But uh, to actually make a wine labeled Prosecco, made from the same grapes, which they can call Prosecco as long as they don't export it. But you'll get Prosecco in Brazil that's cheaper and better than the river of stuff that's coming out of the Veneto these days that reminds us of Pinot Grigio with bubbles, oftentimes, right? They also make method Champenois or method traditional style wines using Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, both using the Charmat process and the method uh, traditional dizzying array of sparkling wine. So pay attention to that when you're out there. Um, and they've uh, been pushing art. They don't drink a lot in Brazil. They drink 1.8 liters per capita per year. That's like a bottle, less than two bottles. Think about how many people they have. And you know what's really sad? When they do drink wine, you know what they drink? Anyone been to Brazil before? Chilean wine, Argentine wine. Why? Why, Evan, did they do that? Well, let's think about it. We have NAFTA, right? They have the Mercosul. The Mercosul is essentially the common market for South America of all of the countries there. So all of these people who export need to figure out what you can do import-wise to sort of calibrate the, 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 what's going on there. So the Brazilians are net exporters. They export heavy machinery, cars, furniture, all these cool things. They go over to all these countries. So Chile, what can you sell us? Well, we have copper. Cool, we'll take copper. Entire economy is based on it. Good else. What else do you have? Vegetables. We have vegetables. What else do you have? We have a lot of wine, and we need to export it. That's their number one thing there. Okay, fine. We'll take in your wine, too. Argentina, what do you got? We got beef. We have beef, too. We don't need your beef. Okay. We have wine. Oh, okay. We have a lot of wine. Fine. We'll take in your wine also, right? Then they ask the Uruguayans, what do you have, our next-door neighbors? Well, we have beef. <laughs> been there, done that. What else do you have? We have wine. Oh, you're kidding. So they have to take in all of these products and they have to tax them at a lower rate than their own wine in order to bring enough in and sell enough to keep the people who run the Mercosul happy. So it's cheaper for you to drink Chilean wine, Argentine wine, and Uruguayan wine in Brazil than it is to drink Brazilian wine. Go figure. All right. Something fun to learn about. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about this. In fact, why don't you pick up your third glass of wine from our friends uh, at Salton. Uh, Salton is a family-run winery, uh, one of the larger wineries, and very much like our friends at Conchitoro, they produce um, everything from very entry-level wine all the way up to um, very, very um, high-end wine as well, too. It dates back to, God, the 1800s. It is a uh, third generation. Uh, it's in the little town of Tuichi in the Vio Valle the Rio das Santas, uh, outside of Serra Gaucha, and um, they, they buy from 700 different families. 
Think about that, which provides about 60% of their fruit. The remaining 40% of their fruit comes from their estate wines. Um, They make 70 different wines, ranging from absolute entry-level basic stuff made from American grapes all the way to the top end. This is one of their more premium wines. This is a wine called Tolento, and it is a blend of 60% Cabernet, 30% 30% Merlot, and 10% Tanat. Tanat is grown in Brazil, as you can imagine, because they are next-door neighbors to where? Uruguay. And that's a big deal in Uruguay, and they get a lot of Uruguayans coming back and forth. What you'll notice is you taste this wine, which, by the way, 13.5% alcohol is the lowest red wine alcohol by volume on the table. And what I find in Brazilian reds in general and Brazilian whites, I might add, too, is that they sort of have one foot in the old world and one foot in the new world. Architecturally, from a structural standpoint, they're a lot like European wines. They're probably the most European of the Bordelais wines. But in terms of the fruit character, they have a lot of new world ripeness to them as well, too. So if you find yourself more of a a Euro drinker, than a New World drinker. As a rule, you're generally going to have a good time in uh, Brazil. If you want that really fleshy, ripe fruit and a lot more generosity, you're probably going to be happier in Argentina and to a degree in, uh, in Chile as well too. Okay, fun place to go. Once again, lots of beef. Don't be a vegetarian going down here. You spend time in the wine country. This is the, co- the continuation of the Argentine Pampa in an area that they call Frontera or Campania, the Gaucha that we talked about before. Serra Gaucha, Campania Gaucha, refers to the Gaucho, the cowboy that goes through there. Okay, So a fun little area that we have there. Um, And a lot of interesting wines, by the way, if you spend time in Brazil, being made down at the Uruguayan border in this area called Campania or Frontera and Livramento da Santana, the wild, wild west border town where you can literally be here. You're in Brazil, here. You're in Uruguay. You can literally cross the border in town. It's kind of nifty. And they have no free, they have free trade, a lot of uh, stuff. Be careful about your wallet, but otherwise it's always a good place to be. All right, last but not least, and I do want to save some time for some Q&A, let's spend a few minutes on Uruguay. Um, Uruguay is the greatest undiscovered jewel of South America. First of all, one of the things the Uruguayans would tell me to tell you is please don't consider, confuse this with Paraguay. Paraguay is not Uruguay. Has anybody here been to Paraguay and Uruguay? Both of them. You will know that Paraguay is not Uruguay. Paraguay is a kind of uh, scary place. Let's just leave it at that. Uruguay is a lot of fun. Um, It's an amazing country. It is uh, extraordinarily progressive in thinking. It's a very stable um, economy and a very stable government. It was the first country in South America to legalize gay marriage. It was the first country in South America to legalize marijuana. So um, I'm not saying that that agrees with your values, but it does show progressiveness, which I think is really cool. Um, there, are an, an, there are three million people in the entire country. One and a half million of them are in Montevideo, which is the main city. There are no traffic jams in this country, right? There is very little visible poverty in this country. There's a very affluent and, um, and uh, happy middle class in this country. Um, it is a really special place. They are amongst the nicest people of all. And a good chunk of the country is actually uh, on the water, whether you're following the Mar del Plata, the continuation of that great Argentine river, or the Atlantic Ocean, um, which starts just uh, to the west of Punta del Este. So it's got a constant sea breeze on the coastal area, which is probably where you'll spend your time. But if you work your way to the far north, up towards the uh, uh, Brazilian border, you're going to find really good wine regions as well. That's where uh, wine, essentially to the uh, east and south of that was was started in Achigas. But there's an area there called uh, Cerro Chapeo, which is essentially essentially a continuation of that same Campania gauch that we talked before. And there's a dear friend of mine, a winemaker named Francisco Carao, who has two wineries, one in Brazil, one in Uruguay. And he takes advantage of everybody on both sides. He's a really good businessman and makes some very good wines as well, too. Uh, Uruguay means land of the painted bird in Guarani. And for an area that's relatively small, at 400 miles north to south and 320 miles east to west, they have over 450 species of bird, which is 50 less than the entire rest of the Amazon combined. Pretty cool. If you're a bird watcher, an aviary person, go. You'll love it here. They drink 27 liters of wine per capita per person. God bless them. 
but there's only three million people, so they don't make a big dent. Um, they actually are the only country in South America that can drink everything that they produce. And actually, if you're a fine wine importer, they actually have to import more because uh, you can figure that out, their productions and stuff like that. Um, the entire production of Chile of both American grapes and vinifera grapes is less than that of the Conchitora group. Think about that. Not a lot of wine. Um, 270 wineries, so there's a, it's a burgeoning little industry for a country that's that small. 90% are family-owned, multi-generational. So if you long for the small family winery, uh, which the mom and dad and grandpa and grandpa and kids are all working together, Uruguay is going to be where you find it. If you long for a culture that loves the female winemaker, go to Chile. That was a, I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. Chile is the, has the... Hires, has more female winemakers than any country in the world outside the United States. So if you are a, how many people here want to be a winemaker, female winemaker? Go to Chile, you'll get great stage opportunities, let me, let me tell you. Um, once again, they are big in reds, 80% of what's produced in this country as well as red, and the lion's share of that is a grape called Tanat, which we'll taste in just a moment. Um, the lion's share of wine production in Chile, uh, rather Uruguay, centers in uh, the area around Montevideo, in a larger appellation called Canelones, which encircles Montevideo, although there is wine made to the very far west in Carmelo, uh, and, and there's stuff made to the very far east in Moldanado, where Punta del Este is. And they have a lot of beef as well, too. You can do beef testing. You can eat beef in Brazil, beef in Uruguay, beef in Argentina. I think you'll like the beef best in Uruguay. Why? Because half of what you're buying in Argentina comes from Uruguay anyway, because they are actually net importers of beef since it's too much money to raise cattle these days. By the way, how many of you have always been sold this big thing that if you want to go to Argentina, that's where all the grass-fed beef is? Special order, because if you don't ask, you will get grain-fed beef. Why? Because some, some people from the Midwest went down there and explained to some of the Argentinian farmers that if you grain raise your cattle, you can get them to the market faster and it's cheaper. Sad, but true. So if you want true grass-fed beef and you don't want to have to think about special ordering it, be in Brazil, be in Uruguay. Um, so again, Tanat is the grape that drives this. Historically, Tanat comes from Tannin. It's a mean, mean grape in Madiran and Iralagi in the Basque country in the southwest, respectively, or vice versa, where it comes from. But it's found its magic fairy dust in a place like uh, Uruguay, where once again, the, 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 the climate seems perfect for it. So you get the deep color, the deep extract, the ripeness without the hard polyphenols. Having said that, we're going to actually start with a uh, wine on the top. The uh, wine number one is an Albariño. Thought that would be kind of fun. This comes from a, a winery called Bodega Garzon, uh, which is located in the little town of Garzon, which is located not far away from Punta del Este, which is the uh, San Tropez of South America, where all the rich go to be seen and hang on the beaches. If that's your crowd, go to Punta del Este in the winter. Um, there is a small but burgeoning little wine industry in Maldonado going on, and in Garzon, where this winery is, is one of the most um, jaw-dropping wineries you'll ever go to. They have as much invested in everything from hospitality to their incredible olive oil production as they do with their wines. Their Albariño, which is the same grape that comes from Spain as Albariño, or Alvariño for Vino Verde in Portugal, produces a delightful little wine in Uruguay. It shares more in common with the Spanish Albariño, I believe, than it does the uh, Portuguese neighbor. Delightful, fresh, full of tropical and stone fruit, and uh, really, really uh, enjoyable for $16 a bottle, I would add. And then your last wine is in glass number five. You'll notice the very dark color. That is one of the uh, signatures of Tanat is this sort of opaque color that you're going to get, and that's usually the case. And uh, when you expect it to come and rip out your mouth, uh, when you try it, you'll note that it doesn't. It's got volume. It's got texture. It has tannin. It has grip. But it's not drying your mouth out completely, nor ripping your tongue, your, your, your tongue apart or your gums from your teeth. Uh, what they've done in, uh, in Uruguay more than any other place in the world for Tanat is they've done more, um, they've done genome studies on it, really, and they've done a lot of experimentation in the vineyard during harvest in production to have really found the sweet spot for where Tanat, Tanat grows. Anyway, on that, I could continue talking for an incredibly long period of time, but I do want to leave the last 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. So um, 
Have at it. Shed from the hip. We have a question on the side there. On the last wine, which would be the uh, Conchitoro, the Cabernet. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. They don't list that here. Um, I could tell you it spent 14 months on French and American oak. I don't get it. I would tell you that for my own taste. It's probably in the high 13s, low 14s maybe, depending on style. Question over here? Yeah. I apologize for those of you who are expecting wines from Bolivia, yeah. <laughs> wine from the Tarija, Taria, and wines from the Ica from Peru, but next time, anyway. Okay, are all these wines oaked, and where does the oak come from? That's an excellent question. Um, I would say that, that uh, of these wines, the uh, Albariño sees no oak. Every one of the other five wines see oak. Uh, the oak is a combination of French oak, um, they do buy American oak as well, too, but you don't see a lot of Slavic oak or other oaks um, around, from around there. Um, generally, they tend to use less oak, except on their very high-end wines uh, in uh, Chile, although oak is a problem for over-oaking down there. Argentina, they tend to pedal to the metal these days. We're all working on trying to wean them off of oak a little bit. The Brazilians probably use the least oak of all, but I would say originally it was because they couldn't afford it. Um, now, as their industry is starting to, to, to do a little bit better, they're starting to play with oak, but they probably see the least amount of over-oaked wines coming out of uh, Brazil of all four of those countries. Next question over here. Uh, hi, I promised a colleague that I would go to South America with her for a wine tour, yep. and uh, she did say she was going to eat beef, mm -hmm. which I don't. But anyway, um, my question to you is how, now you've got me on Ur Uruguay, <laughs> and I'm, we were probably thinking three months. Yeah. And so can you go by train from country to, how do I start yeah safely that's a great two that's, women? A, that's that's a great question um, first of all it is I, I would I would I would give you the heads up right now that it's not like going wine tasting in the Napa Valley or anything like that even the most developed places in the world here the lion's share of wineries are kind of off the beaten track on roads that your GPS isn't gonna find Oftentimes, the people who speak no English and security guards and all that. So the best single thing you can do when you decide where you're going to go is get help. The other, play, the other reality of these parts of the world is they have draconian drinking and driving laws. And if you don't want to spend two-thirds of your trip in jail trying to get yourself out of a DUI, I would also recommend either going on a tour or doing that. You can go on organized tours, or you can actually find individual companies that specialize in personalized tours, all of which are in the book, so I would recommend getting the book. Um, but what I would say is, uh, a, you know, the, it, it, it's a big continent, so if you're giving yourself a lot of time, that's an, uh, that's an attribute. Um, planes are irregular, they go on strike a lot, uh, trains are not particularly good, you will be doing a lot of driving um, if you choose to drive, or the other thing that you and I would never consider in this country, but is a mainstay of that part of the world, are twofold. One, in some cases, to get between countries, ferries. Um, the, between Argentina and Uruguay in particular, the regular ferries that go from Buenos Aires to uh, Carmelo, Buenos Aires to Montevideo, and that's a regular thing. You can pick up a car on either side. But the other thing that I would tell you, which is going to be true across Argentina, Brazil to Uruguay, all these countries, is buses. Now, I know before you have bad dreams of ugly, dirty greyhounds, um, they have buses that are sort of luxury buses that have fold-down beds, that, have, that they feed you like on an airplane, not the greatest food, that they have movies going on, that you have drivers who play bingo with you, not while they're driving. <laughs> They do that. That that literally are are set up for sort of luxury travel, and a lot of people typically get on a bus at night, wake up the next day, and they're where they want to be. And it's a very affordable way. It's a much more predictable way, and it's a far less expensive way than flying. So I would say combinations of driving and buses are going to be good. You know, you can take planes. You can take a plane from Mendoza to Buenos Aires. You can take a plane from, you know, Porto Alegre down to Montevideo. But you'll also get a very rich experience if, if you don't mind doing it, uh, doing some of these buses. I know it sounds sort of, oh, Evan, that's kind of scary, but it's actually quite cool. Um, depending on what your goal is from the perspective of wine, you can actually start 
um, in southern Brazil, which is where I would recommend. There is wine made in very northern Brazil uh, between Bahia and the Pernambuco and the Valle, appropriately, do São Francisco of San Francisco. But it's not, I mean, it's interesting to see. I wouldn't spend a lot of time there. And you're way far north. But if you start in southern Brazil, you can work your way down through Uruguay, come up through, um, through uh, uh, Argentina, do Buenos Aires, do Mendoza, and then hop Mendoza, go over the Andes to do Santiago and Chile, work your way off there, and then you'll have done a wonderful amount of the wine stuff. And then depending on what you want to do, spending a little bit of time in Lima, especially if you like to eat, go to Lima. Uh, that's, a, that's probably the culinary capital of South America right now. And um, there's actually some very cool things going on in Bolivia as well, too. So uh, a couple of months, you'd have an absolutely uh, motorcycle diaries Epicurean adventure. <laughs> be very, very cool. We'll take the last question back here. Hi, so can you go over what the tasting notes are supposed to be for the different wines we tried tonight and then what you're supposed to be smelling from each of sure, the different wines? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I didn't, we didn't provide fact sheets on these and all of these wines, by the way, if you want to just literally pull your tasting mat from underneath, you can take your, your uh, mat with you, go online, find the tech sheets for most all of them. And if you go to a wonderful site like uh, Wine Searcher, you can actually get the pricing and availability on them as well too, either uh, locally, if they're available locally, which most of them are, or if you wanted to fly in a wine from another state, you could do that as well too. Um, the first wine that you add is the, Gal the Garzón Albariño. Um, and as I said before, this comes from uh, the area Modena uh, 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 of uh, Modenado from the little town of Garzón, north of Punta del Este. It is 100% Albariño. Um, it is spent no time in oak. It is six months on stainless steel with a little bit of lees stirring. And Albariño typically is going to give you very bright, crunchy, zesty acidity. And in a riper style like this one is, you're going to find um, stone fruit, most notably probably light notes of uh, peaches and a little bit of nectarine, a bit of tropicality, some melon in there, and a little bit of that sort of zippy, citrusy sort of character that we like. A uh, bit of texture. Um, this is probably amongst the higher altitudes, so they get a minimal amount of uh, so-called thermal amplitude, the difference between the highs and lows of the day that extend the growing season and make that wine very, very ripe. And the wine, as I said before, I think I said it was 16 It's actually $18. Um, the second wine that you have is the Chardonnay from Conchitoro, from their uh, Grande Reserva Series Riberas. These are wines that are single vineyard wines that come from along rivers. As I said before, this comes from uh, the area outside of... Uh, of uh, Colchagua on the um, in Litu Lit 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 uh, my Spanish is terrible. Litueche, Lit Litueche, I guess would be pronounced. One hundred percent Chardonnay. Um, spent nine months uh, medium toasted French oak. As I said before, you have uh, a bit of tropical fruit. Uh, here once again, but this to me is more defined by its citrus notes, a little bit more of the green apple, um, a nice amount of toasty oak without being over vanillaed, over candied, over uh, hard candied, and um, I think you probably noticed in the back a very, again, zippy character of acidity, which is probably not what you used to expect from Chilean Chardonnay, and it's a bit expansive in the back palate as well. Uh, the first red wine from is the is the Salton, or yes, yeah, the Salton Talento. So I said before, this is a blend of 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, 30% Merlot, 10% Tanat. It uh, retails in the high 20s. Very spotty availability, as is the case with most Brazilian wine, I might add, at this point in time. And it's got a little bit of the sort of dark plum, dusty earth character that you would find in Bordeaux, a little bit of mulberry, um, a small amount of oak, a bit of herbal uh, characteristic to it, but not herbaceous in the sense of being green. Um, once again, sort of crunchy acidity and um, good length. By the way, this is the first fair trade certified winery in Brazil, which given its size is pretty extraordinary. Um, the next one you have was the Vistalba, as I said before. This is a Corte, 80% uh, Malbec, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, characterized by sort of a very rich, creamy mouthfeel, a lot of uh, deep, dense fruit, uh, blackberries, uh, uh, blueberry, a little bit of black plum, very soft and creamy middle palate, not a lot of tan in there, just a, a bit of grip, and once again, very good acidity. Uh, I think that's one of the hallmarks that you find across all these wines. Retails for $14. Uh, the Uruguayan Tanat from our friends at Garzón as, uh, comes from essentially the same vineyard, um, as we said before. Uh, the difference here being that the wine is 100% Tanat, has seen some oak, 
uh, on it and retails for roughly uh, the same price, right around $18. And our last wine is the uh, Conchitoro uh, Cabernet wine, which was a blend of Cabernet and Carmenere in exact percentages, let me give you before, of 90% Cabernet, 10% Carmenere from the Marchique area. Um, and here, once again, a lot of good, dense, uh, plummy fruit, just a bit of graphite and a little bit of that sort of dusty cedar box character, a little peppery, uh, which might be necessarily from the Cabernet, but more from the Carmenere. Um, some tannin, but again, not mouth ripping, excellent acidity, and $15 a bottle retail. Thank you so much, Evan. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Just a reminder, Evan's book is for sale just outside, and he will be signing and answering more questions. Thanks so much, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs>